everyone, and welcome to Chapter Book Storytime Variety Pack. Today we're going to have our Halloween edition, and I've got some great scary stories for you that you might like to try out at EVPL. If scary stories aren't your cup of tea, then maybe you'll want to skip this video or, and look at an older one, or wait till next week when Miss Jessica will be back. But for this time of year, a lot of people like a good scary story. The first one today is called The Halloween Moon by Joseph Fink. These are all the parts of the story that I want to read to you, so I've got some sticky notes on them. This book is available in print at EVPL, so you could call up one of your favorite branches or go online to evpl.org and put a hold on the book and we'll reserve a copy for you. All right, let's get started. The first and the most important thing you need to know about our main character, Esther Gold, is that she loves Halloween. Esther Gold loved Halloween. Maybe you love Halloween. Maybe you dress up every year and put a lot of time and care into your costume. Maybe you watch scary movies and then can't sleep but also can't resist watching more. Maybe candy corn tastes better to you than any other candy. Not because it tastes better, it doesn't. But because it tastes like a moment in time, like a season. But you don't love Halloween the way Esther did. Esther refused to watch anything that wasn't a scary movie. Her dad liked to watch sitcoms. Her mom liked to watch important dramas starring important people. Her brother liked watching movies in which people kissed although he pretended he didn't. But Esther only liked movies with darkness and Dutch angles and the part where the main character leans down to the sink to wash their face and then when they look up again, there's a pale, menacing creature behind them in the mirror. Ooh. Esther made three different costumes every Halloween. One was for school, one was for trick-or-treating, and one was in case the other two didn't turn out as well as she thought they would. She put more time into her backup costumes than most people put into any costume they would ever wear. Esther didn't even like candy, but she collected as much as she possibly could for the sheer act of collecting it. She would eat some of it, sure, it was fine, but mostly the contents of her overflowing bag went to friends and to her brother, or sometimes to the trash, if her parents discovered how much can candy she had managed to collect. Unhealthy, her father often said. He was right. Greedy, her mother often said. She was wrong. Esther wasn't greedy about candy. She didn't collect it merely to have it. She collected it because it was part of the ritual of Halloween. And more than anything, she loved that annual night when everyone gave up on being realistic and clear-headed and being too old for scary stories and just let themselves pretend a little. This is what Halloween was to Esther. It was a night in which the whole neighborhood came together to tell a story. And above all, Esther loved stories. Yes, Esther Gold loved Halloween. But one year, Halloween was not a holiday about getting together to pretend a scary story. One year, the scary story became real. Esther Gold plans to celebrate Halloween forever, to keep telling that scary story. But on the Halloween, the year she's turned 13, her mother and father sit her down. They want to have a serious discussion. It comes down to this, Est, her dad says. We think maybe this is the year you don't go trick-or-treating. Her heart made a move she had never felt before, like it had shrunk, but also relocated somewhere in her knees. What? she whispered. Her voice didn't sound like her. Who was that hoarse and timid weakling using her mouth to speak? Oh, honey, her mom said, I know you love trick-or-treating, but that's something for children to do. And you're not a child anymore. That doesn't mean you have to stop having fun. Maybe you could answer the door in your costume. Give candy to the kids. It might be fun to be on the other side of the equation for the first time. Or we could have a little Halloween dinner, make pumpkin cupcakes or something. Esther felt the need to lie down. 
This was horrible. Oh, okay, okay, she says, looking for some angle to bargain with. I see what you're saying, and I understand. This will be the last year I will go trick-or-treating. It'll be hard, but, but you're right. After this year, I will be done. She didn't mean any of that. She would be right out there next year, but it would give her 12 whole months to figure out how to work around her parents. No, honey, you're not hearing us, her mom said. Last year was the last year. You're not going to trick-or-treat this year. It isn't optional. I hate you, Esther shouted. That wasn't what she meant to say. She didn't hate them, but she couldn't believe they were doing this to her, and she didn't know what other, use, what other words to use to communicate that utter disbelief. Lately, she had been feeling more emotions than she had words to express, and if that was what being a teenager was, then count her out on that. Esther, her dad said, shaking his head in disappointment. You don't hate us, her mom said. You also shouldn't make strong statements like that if you don't mean them. I do, she said. I do hate you. She didn't hate them. She didn't even know why she was saying it, but she couldn't stop herself. All right, hate us, her dad said. You're not going trick-or-treating either way. That, isn't part of, that part isn't your choice. Your choice is if you want to be angry and miserable about it or have a good night instead. Honey, listen, you still can do something fun, her mom said. We're going to let this tantrum you're throwing right now slide because we know how hard this is for you. We are, said her dad to her mom. We do? Yes, we do and we are. Oh, I know. Why don't you go with Gus and his mom to the movies? Of course, that was it. Gus would be her way out of this. She forced herself to smile, take a few breaths. She wanted to trick or treat, and so she would. Her parents' wishes would not get in the way of her own. You're right, Mom, Dad. I'm sorry I said all that. She, she really wasn't sorry. I'll call Gus and see if I can go with them. Thanks for suggesting it. She got up and walked to her room. Her mom and dad looked at each other, trying to figure out if they had done the parenting thing correctly. In her room, Esther pulled up her most recent text chat. She and Gus had been best friends for years. Hey, we need to talk, she typed. You around? Sure, cool. Want me to head over? No, I'll come to you. See you in five. And so, as she walks to Gus's house, she makes a plan. She's going to say she's going to the movies, and Gus is going to tell her, his mom that he's going trick-or-treating with Esther. And so they're going to sneak out, and Esther will get to go trick-or-treating anyway. She doesn't want to stop. She never wants Halloween to end. Esther tells Gus her plan, and Gus agrees. And same as every other year, Esther starts planning her, her costumes for trick-or-treat. But as the days get closer to Halloween, Esther begins to notice that there are some strange things going on in her neighborhood. One day on her way home from school, as she reached her corner, she heard strange music in the air. She'd never heard music like it before. It was the warbling chime of an ice cream truck. But the melody wasn't any of the happy or annoying melodies those trucks usually blared. Instead, the music sounded sad or even angry. The song was complex and long, and a little off-key. It was the music an ice cream truck would play at a funeral, if anyone was ever eccentric enough to have an ice cream truck at their funeral. The source of the music came trundling out of the cul-de-sac with worn tires and a hood belching puffs of black smoke. The ice cream truck, if that's what it was, was filthy, and along the side of the truck there was a faded image of a jack-o'-lantern drawn so crudely that it barely resembled any jack-o'-lantern she had ever seen. In chipped and badly applied type around the jack-o'-lantern were the words, Queen of Halloween Pumpkins, get yours while they last. The pumpkin truck isn't the only strange vehicle in town. A couple nights before Halloween, Dad comes into Esther's room and says, Hey, do you want to see something a little funny? He indicated toward the front window and she followed him out. Parked down the block was another ice cream truck playing discordant, mournful music. Heard that song and couldn't stand it, her dad said. He was very sensitive to pitch. 
but funny, right? Who sells fruit from an ice cream truck? This truck had a picture of a big rosy apple, the kind that would be poisoned in a fairy tale. Every part of the truck, from the tires to the warbling speakers on top, was pristine. Queen of Halloween apples, they have a bite, said the text under the picture of the apple. Should we? Her dad asked. Esther remembered the other truck, the much dirtier one, and the sullen man driving it. I don't think so. It's, it seems weird. Oh, it's worth a shot, her dad said. He went outside, and after a moment hesitating, she went after. Hi there, her dad called out as they approached the truck. Selling apples? She held her breath and stepped a little closer, and then the window popped open. A man stuck his head out. He was a pleasant-looking man in his 20s, wearing a neat white uniform with a white paper hat. His hair was combed back under the hat. Every detail about him was exactly in the right place. Good evening, sir, the young man said. I'm afraid not just yet. Tomorrow is when business starts. Scouting out the area, her dad said. The man smiled. It was wide and friendly, but also practiced. Esther felt that if the man smiled a thousand times, each one would land in exactly the same way. Something like that, the man said, and he held out his hand. Dan Apple. Dan Apple? Her dad asked, shaking the hand. The man looked furious for a moment, a violent and animal rage, but then his pleasant smile was back, broad and warm, exactly where it had been. The shift was so quick that Esther wasn't sure she had seen it. April, he said. Similar, I know, but at least I'm not my brother. Is he the one with the pumpkin truck? Esther asked. The man shifted his smile to her like a spotlight, seeking out an escaped prisoner. Why, yes, you must have seen him driving around. I apologize for the state of the truck. He doesn't have the same enthusiasm for customer service that I do. But yes, he sells pumpkins. Well, why did you say that at least you're not like your brother? His name is Ed Pumpkin. You can imagine that confusion. Why do you have different last names? He leaned down toward her. His smile was like a paper-thin mask, and she felt there was a face so terrible it hardly was human waiting right behind it. You ask a lot of questions, he said, and then he laughed, and then he was genuine and happy again. Well, thanks for stopping by. Hope to see you both tomorrow. And he looked down at Esther. I'll have my eye on you tomorrow night. There was ice in his voice. Her dad didn't seem to hear it. He walked back toward the house chuckling, and Esther hurried ahead of him, waiting to get as far from the truck as possible. But that's not all. The night before Halloween, Esther can't sleep. She's so excited about Halloween, and just a little bit guilty about fooling her parents. But that's when she hears it. There was a hacking cough from outside her window, then noises of an engine barely holding it together. She sat up in bed and looked out. The ice cream truck that sold pumpkins was limping its way down the street, black smoke pouring from its hood. Ed Pumpkin was in the driver's seat, one arm out the window. As he drove under a streetlight, she saw a glimpse of his face as grumpy as before and his crooked hat and own uncombed hair. What was he doing driving around this late? She didn't trust him or his brother. There was a movement behind the truck a small group of children in Halloween costumes running in formation. Their costumes were ragged and torn. One child was dressed as an astronaut, another a dinosaur, a third as a wizard. But it looked like their costumes had been buried for years and then dug up. Even as they passed in and out of the streetlights, she still couldn't quite see their faces. What she was seeing now scared her, like a scary movie. It scared directly and simply. She didn't quite believe what she was seeing, even as, as she had no choice but to admit that she was seeing it. A long shadow unwound itself, covering the whole of the street. The source of the shadow was out of view of her window. Ed slowed his truck to a groaning halt. He got out of the truck, wiping at his grease-stained uniform. His paper hat had fallen crumpled on the floor of the, by the driver's seat, and his hair hung over his face.
He walked slowly toward the source of the shadow, and the children in costumes followed him. Then he stopped and got down on his knees right in the middle of the street, and the children did the same. He and the trick-or-treaters bowed, pressing their foreheads to the asphalt. What were they bowing to? Esther strained her face against the glass, trying to see, but all she managed to do was fog the window. She was afraid to move to another window. Better maybe that she not know. Better maybe that she never find out. Ed rose back to his knees. His forehead was red where he had pushed it to the street. Your Highness, he said, all is prepared. He did not sound like he was shouting, but his voice echoed eerily off the sidewalk and the houses, and Esther could easily hear every word. The children, also back up on their knees, made a buzzing, clicking sound, like insects. Great, said a commanding voice from outside Esther's view. I'll tell you what, that is absolutely fantastic. Just great work from all of you. Thank you, your highness, Ed said. Uh, you can go now, the voice said. You're dismissed or whatever. Thank you, your highness. What in the world had Esther just seen? She lay back down, eyes wide on the ceiling, and did not sleep for hours. She couldn't tell whether she was excited that this Halloween was turning out truly weird and creepy, or terrified that figures straight out of her horror movies were standing in her street. When she wakes up, it's Halloween, and Esther and Gus successfully sneak out of the house and go trick-or-treating. Esther is having a great time. This is her favorite day of the year, after all. But as the night goes on, she begins to notice there are no other children trick-or-treating. Where are they? And also, the, adult, the adults are missing, too. When she goes to some of her favorite houses that have the best decorations and the best candy, no one answers the door. Esther and Gus want to find out what's going on. And they find out at the next house, Mr. Winchell. Every year he has the best decorations, and every year he has a party for grown-ups while their kids are trick-or-treating. And this is where they find something shocking. Even with everything else that happened, they felt as though they were doing something wrong when they walked through the front door into the adult side of the party. An upbeat rock song with a lot of bass shook the pictures off the walls. There were red plastic cups everywhere and cupcakes shaped like jack-o'-lanterns. But mostly, there were sleeping people. An entire party of adults sprawled asleep on the couch, on the floor, face first into the snack table. Some of them had plates by their hands or drinks spilled down their chests. Two of them had fallen asleep in a position that would have been horrifyingly embarrassing if they had been awake to know what was happening. Esther and Gus stepped over the man by the door who had fallen asleep with a trick-or-treat bowl of candy in his hand, little foil-wrapped bars spilling into his face. They're all breathing, right? Esther asked. Yeah, they're breathing fine, Gus said. They're just, they're asleep. Esther was already pulling out her cell phone, calling 911. Forget getting in trouble. This was an emergency. There was something very wrong and she needed to get help for these people. The line rang and rang. No one picked up. She tried it again. Nothing. And then the situation got worse. Artificial chimes playing a lurching waltz with the notes just out of tune. They went to the doorway. The truck pulled up in front of the house. Queen of Halloween apples. The horrible man she had met yesterday got out. His uniform and hair were as neat and as spotless as before. Hey kids, he called with a friendly wave. I'm Dan, Dan Abel. I remember you, Esther said. Well, what seems to be the problem here? He strode up the walk, humming to himself, and poked his head inside. Esther and Gus retreated farther into the house to keep away from him. Mmm, Dan said with exaggerated concern. Yeah, this seems like quite a bad situation you've gotten yourself into. It looks like these folks are taking a nap, and you're in here bothering them. You shouldn't do that, you know. It's rude. Did you do this? Esther said. Oh, did I do this? He laughed, actually slapping his knee. Oh, gosh, gosh, I'm not nearly powerful enough to do something like this. But I think I know who did. And I'll tell you what else, kids. He cocked his head. His broad smile was exactly as perfect as it had been the day before and exactly as false. 
I think whoever did this is only getting started. You should run home to your parents now. His voice became cold, even as his toothy smile held. It's going to be a long night. A very, very long night. What is going on in this town? Where are the children? And why are the, adu the adults all asleep? To find the answer to these questions and many more, take a look at The Halloween Moon by Joseph Fink. Available at EVP. Our next chapter book is another creepy one. It's called Nightmares by Jason Siegel and Kristen Miller. This is the first book in a series, and it's available as an ebook, an e audiobook, and a print book. There are lots of ways to enjoy it. All you need is your EVPL library card. This is the story of Charlie Laird. Charlie Laird is having trouble sleeping. Or I guess I should say he's having trouble staying awake. He doesn't want to sleep because that's when the nightmares come. Charlie's nightmares started after he moved into the old Deschamps mansion, a huge purple Victorian house sitting high on a hill overlooking the village. He used to be fascinated with the house. He wondered who lived there and who built it and what kind of life they had. And he was really surprised when his mother told him that she had once been in the house and she had played there with a young girl named Charlotte. Well, time has passed. Charlie's mother has passed away, and Dad remarried Charlotte, now grown up, and they all have moved into the Deschamps mansion. Charlie's having trouble sleeping. He drinks coffee at night to try to stay awake, he, but he always ends up falling asleep and having the nightmares. He's beginning to fall asleep at school. He's beginning to argue with everybody in his family and even with his friends at school, and it's beginning to take a toll. Let's take a look at one of his nightmares. Chapter four is called The Witch. Look who's here, something purred, and just in time for dinner. Splendid, said a second voice. The words were followed by a familiar cackle. So glad you could join us, Charlie. And aren't you looking just scrumptious tonight? A jolt of fear made Charlie's eyes snap open. He was no longer in his room. His bed was shoved up against a crumbling stone wall that was splattered with patches of moss and mold. He'd been to the witch's dungeon before, but this time he could see the cavernous space even more clearly. A roaring fire had been built in the center of the room. A cloud of smoke rolled above him. Charlie struggled to sit up, only to discover that he'd been tied down as usual. Ropes chafed his wrists and ankles. He could lift his head just high enough to see the witch seated beside an enormous cauldron, chopping up a slab of meat. The contents of the pot belched every time she dropped a hunk in. As the witch rose from her seat, she tossed a handful of scraps onto a rubbish heap in the corner. Charlie spotted a dull-sized skull and a broken bat wing sticking out of the pile. Still clutching her cleaver, the witch glided over to where Charlie lay. A giant black cat the size of a panther trotted beside her. Then it crouched and jumped up on Charlie's chest. Oof! Charlie wheezed as the wind was knocked out of him. He's still awfully puny, the cat sniffed Charlie's face and then ran her tongue up the side of his head. He doesn't taste very good either. Oh, the bitter ones never do, the witch sighed, but we'll eat him if we have to. I stocked up on that sauce we like, just in case. The witch was dressed in ankle-sweeping black dress she always wore. Her mask-like face was a sickly green, and her hair, if she had any, was tucked beneath a sleek black hat. But it was her eyes that made her so terrible to behold. The lenses were silvery mirrors. Whenever Charlie looked at the witch, he was forced to see himself. Just when it was becoming difficult for Charlie to breathe, the cat hopped off his chest and wound around the witch's legs. Charlie drew in a deep breath. Get these ropes off me, you old nasty hag, he shouted. The witch gasped. Oh dear, did you hear that? I think he's trying to hurt my feelings. She bent down until her nose was only inches from Charlie's. He could see his revolted expression reflected in her eyes. Don't waste your breath, boy. Hag is a compliment in this neck of the woods. So let's get down to business. Where do you want to spend the night? My cage or the cat's belly? 
The choice is yours. Charlie trembled at the thought of the cage upstairs. It swung in the open air at the top of the witch's belfry, where a giant bell might have been. Old and rusty, the cage looked like it was built to house a monstrous bird. The first time Charlie had seen it, a skeleton bit had been curled up in one corner. He watched that with horror as the witch had pulled the cage down and swept out the bones. Now the cage belonged to Charlie. In most of his nightmares, that's where the witch put him. Frigid winds always blew up through the bars. Sometimes rain would pelt him. Other times he'd be buried in snow. But the weather wasn't the worst part. Charlie's time in the cage was so lonely that just a few hours could feel like a week. Still, Charlie never once tried to escape. For a long time, he told himself there was nowhere to go. The truth was, he was terrified of the forest that surrounded the bell tower. He felt there was something waiting for him down there, something much, much worse than a witch. Do what you want to me, Charlie growled at the witch. As soon as it's morning, I'll wake up in my bed. So rude, the cat said with a yawn as she nuzzled against her mistress's side. Isn't he? The witch pretended to pout. Such a nasty little thing. No wonder nobody on the other side wants him back. They must be sick of him too. The words stung. They hurt all the more because Charlie suspected they were true. Lately, the only people who'd been spared his anger were his three best friends, and who knew how long that would last. We'd be doing everyone a favor if we left the boy in the cage for good, the cat said. Oh, but think of the work, the witch groaned. I have to bring him water every day and change the newspaper once a month and... Well, then perhaps, the cat interrupted, it would be best if we eat him. I couldn't agree more, the witch said, stuff shuffling away. I'll get the sauce. You set up the spit. Charlie closed his eyes and tried his best to stay calm. This is a dream, he whispered, trying to convince himself. I'm having a nightmare, and nightmares aren't real. The witch turned back and shoved her nose in his face. Her breath smelled like she'd been nibbling at the rubbish pile. What was that? She said with a cackle. <laughs> Sounds like someone's been lying to you, telling you nightmares aren't real. I'll show you how real I am. Tomorrow I'll pay a visit to your world. Could she make good on her threats? Charlie wondered. Could she come to the mansion and drag him away? You'll never get into my room. The witch cackled while the cat howled with laughter. We'll see about that. I wouldn't be much of a witch if a few stupid boxes wouldn't stop me. Every, every night, Charlie packed moving boxes, still not unpacked, in front of his door in hopes that nobody comes to get him. How do you know? Charlie blurted out. The witch plopped down beside him on the bed. Her dress reeked of mildew and mothballs. About the boxes in your room? I know a lot of things. She combed her clawed fingers through Charlie's hair. He squirmed with disgust, but she merely seemed to notice. Do you know why people think nightmares aren't real? Charlie was too confused to answer. Something had changed. This nightmare was different from the rest. The witch had never spoken to him like this before. Because most people wake up the witch continued. Their spirits come here when they sleep, and their bodies stay safe and sound in your world until morning. She leaned in closer. But you know what I figured out? I figured out how to bring your body here to the netherworld, too. Charlie stopped struggling. Dread wrapped around him like a straitjacket. How? he asked. The witch brushed his cheek with the back of her hand. If your fear is powerful enough, your body can travel to the other side, she told him. And I've never seen anyone as scared as you, Charlie Laird. Charlie might have been scared, but he was angry, too. Don't flatter yourself, he spat. If you and your cat are the most terrifying things this place has to offer, then I'm going to be just fine. The witch smiled, and Charlie could see the rotten nubs of her teeth. Oh, I think we both know that I'm not your worst nightmare. 
there's another nightmare out there that scares you much more than I do. Isn't there, Charlie? Charlie's whole body went numb. The other one was never to be mentioned out loud. The other one was a million times more terrifying than the witch. Your worst nightmare and I are very good friends, she, the witch continued. In fact, she's probably waiting for you outside as we speak. Would you like me to invite her in? I bet she's dying for a little chat. Charlie squeezed his eyes shut. No, he whispered. No, please no. I'd rather be eaten. Oh, did you hear that? The cat sounded delighted. He told us to eat him. And it is dinner time. Would you mind if I start off with a few of his toes? Be my guest, said the witch. He won't need them once he's in the cage. The cat stretched her mouth open, and Charlie screamed as she bit down, but her fangs passed right through his foot. Blast! He's fading, the cat howled. Quick, chop me off a piece. Not this time, the witch said with a grin, but he'll be back. Charlie knows he can't get away. Ah! Charlie could hear himself screaming, but he couldn't stop. Someone was shaking him. He forced his eyes open. Ah! There was just enough daylight in the room to, for Charlie to see a person in a cardboard mask leaning over his bed. It's me, the kid squeaked. Jack, gasped, Charlie gasped, and relief washed over him. The figure at his bedside pulled its mask up. Charlie's eight-year-old brother was wearing the Captain America costume he discovered while snooping around in Charlie's boxes. You okay? Jack asked. Yeah, Charlie said, still struggling to catch his breath. Were you having a bad dream? Jack whispered. It must have been really scary. Jack, Charlie winced with embarrassment and flopped back on the bed. Uh, how'd you get in here? He glanced over at the door. Jack had pushed the boxes back just enough to slide through a narrow crack. So much for the barricades, Charlie thought miserably. It's time to get up, Jack announced. Charlotte made breakfast. It wasn't even eight in the morning, and Charlie could already feel the darkness brewing inside him. It was going to be a very bad day. What a terrifying nightmare. I can't believe he has one of those every night. That is horrible. And yet, the witch says that there is another fear that Charlie has that's even greater and the witch calls the, the fear a she. She's waiting for Charlie. And Charlie's even more afraid of that. Well, as it says in the book jacket, nightmares can ruin a good night's sleep, but when they start slipping out of your dreams and into the waking world, that's a line that should never be crossed. The witch did say that she can now go into Charlie's world. And when your worst nightmares start to come true, well, that's something only Charlie can face, and he's going to need all the help he can get, or it might just be lights out for Charlie Laird, for good. This is called Nightmares by Jason Siegel and Kristen Miller. Well, that's it for our Halloween edition of Chapterbook Storytime Variety Pack. I hope you liked our scary stories, that you were a little bit scared, but not too scared. But I really hope that you want to come and get these books and read them for yourself and find out what happens. Today we read The Halloween Moon by Joseph Fink and Nightmares by Jason Siegel and Kristen Miller. Two spooky stories for this time of year. I hope you like them. If you'd like to get a copy, you can get them through our app, Hoopla or Libby. Or you can get a copy through our catalog, evpl.org. You can put a hold on the book, and it'll be delivered to your favorite branch for you to pick up. Uh, you can also call the library, call your favorite branch, and the, and the friendly staff there will help you. They're always willing to lend a hand. Happy Halloween. Bye-bye.